We're at the 22nd Croy. I'm Fred Scheich with IFARA, and we're here with Ken Mayer and Renee Ridson. And both of them are going to be talking on some world health issues of great importance and, uh, and sometimes great concern. So we'll uh, begin with who wants to begin? Yeah. Renee? Okay. Oh, okay, thank you very much, Fred. Very nice to see you. And uh, nice to be able to talk uh, to the audience today. Uh, an important thing that we learned about at this uh, uh, conference was the continuing story about the scale up and roll, roll out of male circumcision for HIV prevention in Africa. This is an important intervention for uh, the 14 priority countries in southern and eastern Africa that have been, have been identified. Uh, what is great is that as of 2014, over 9 million circumcisions have been done. So this is an important and successful scale up. And it's very effective. We know it prevents about 60% uh, 60 effective in preventing infection in uh, heterosexual HIV uninfected men. Uh, it's also to, uh, important to point out that eventually when the men uh, in the population are protected by uh, male circumcision, it will also protect the women. Uh, to the same extent or, or lesser? It, the, the modeling data, because we don't have real data yet, but the modeling data does indicate that the, that the uh, protective effect is nearly equal in the two mm -hmm. sexes, sexes after about 10 years uh, after scale. Um, so we heard great news about the, the success of the scale up. The, the intervention is very safe, it's acceptable, and it's being widely implemented. So it's great, and we're happy to hear that uh, there will be continued male circumcision programs, continuation of the programs. The one important issue, or the one sort of uh, not so good news, is that because of the flatline uh, budgets and PEPFAR, the continued the funding uh, may not continue at the current rate. So some of the programs may need to be contracted, which is unfortunate because we know this is an important intervention. So is this, is this specific programs or parts of, of cutbacks on each program or how do they, how do they manipulate that? Some of the programs have had, had to been contracted, so the, uh, um, the continued acceleration has been slowed. And, and you have more infections, right? So there's more people to, to uh, be in a program per se, right? Well, there's a growth of the population in need. Is that is that accurate? The, yes, there is growth of the population in need because the uh, the program is targeted at the uh, men uh, at about 15 to 24 is the real uh, target population, and we have to remember that every year there's a new group of men who come into that program mm -hmm. or come into that age cohort and who need to have this intervention. Um, so. Uh, Ken, you're up. Yeah, so, so this was a great conference with some very good news, but it's, it's again one of these best of times, worst of times kind of situations. So we heard that there were uh, two additional studies of the use of oral pre-exposure prophylaxis, PrEP. These were both European studies. One uh, was uh, done in the UK and involved a waiting list uh, so that half the people were told they'd get PrEP eventually. The other half, uh, these were men obsessed with men, um, get, had access to immediate uh, daily PrEP. 86% uh, reduction in the number of new infections um, in, in, with that trial design. Another study, a uh, French study, which also had a site in Canada, um, found that um, event-driven PrEP, uh, if individuals took two pills before and a pill a day after uh, at-risk exposure, that was highly protected, the same level of protection. That study needs a little more unpacking because we need to look at the people's patterns of behavior to, to know that we can recommend just event-driven PrEP uh, for men who have sex with men. There's a study uh, of heterosexual discordant couples in Kenya and Uganda, the Partners PrEP study, and in that setting, they enrolled new couples, and because we know that treatment uh, also is prevention, that treatment will make people less infectious and drive down the likelihood of transmission, they enrolled couples, uh, about a third of the couples, the female partner was infected, two thirds of the male partner was infected. They each enrolled with the primary partner, and they were given a menu of options. Uh, the majority of individuals opted for uh, a pattern where uh, the uninfected partner would start PrEP and then the infected partner would go on PrEP and the uninfected partner would stay on PrEP for a fixed period of time. 
because we know it takes time for the, uh, the viral load to go down in the blood, that also takes time for the viral load uh, to go down in semen or cervicovaginal secretions. So that study, there were almost no infections seen in individuals who opted for this, this pattern of using PrEP as a bridge and then the infected partner going on treatment. It wasn't perfect because in the real world, people sometimes have outside partners, uh, relationships change, but it certainly suggested uh, that in the African context, both PrEP and treatment as prevention, particularly treatment as prevention, uh, can have a really potent public health benefit. Piece of bad news was uh, a third study looking at a vaginal gel in young women in uh, KwaZulu-Natal, uh, sorry, in, in several places in Southern Africa. There was an original study only in KwaZulu-Natal. This was a broader study. It was a tiebreaker study because the first study suggested a modest protective benefit of, of gel containing tenofovir. This uh, third study did not show benefit, and there was really a very low level of adherence. And, and so we have to also design products that people will use, <coughs> excuse, excuse me, or do a better job of community education. So I'm getting over a little bronchitis. So, so you know, it's sobering, and it says that uh, it's not any, any amount of medication in any way that you give it. You really have to be thoughtful and understand the pharmacology. You have to understand the behaviors. But now we do have these potent tools. You know, um, at the present time, we only have pills. There's future work that was presented at this meeting looking at injectable medication, which may in the long term be beneficial. There are two studies underway still of vaginal rings that to look at whether that's protective. These are rings containing antiviral medication uh, that can be inserted once a month. So we just have to understand, are the women going into the trial because they want to be in a trial, or do they believe in the ring, and will the ring stay in for that period of time enough to show protection? But as of today, what we do know is that oral medication can be protective, but oral medication, even at generic prices, uh, has a cost. It's, and it's not candy, it's something that needs medical monitoring, so it's not just a simple matter, take these pills and we'll see you in a few, few years. So that involves infrastructure and uh, the kind of uh, training of healthcare professionals uh, that can be knowledgeable working with these medications. Because of PEPFAR, because of the Global Fund, the scale up has been remarkable. And at this conference, there were several best practice examples that were, were presented. But very similar to uh, what Renee just related with regard to circumcision, because of flatlining of these global budgets, uh, the only way to expand treatment and then to also make PrEP available for key individuals who are uh, young, uninfected, at high risk for HIV, the only way to really do both of those things realistically is to do more with less. So that means things like task shifting, uh, um, who, who delivers the medication, how it gets delivered, smarter ways of um, engaging the community and uh, keeping track of records, because again, this is not uh, something that people should be doing on, on the fly. Mm -hmm. uh, but the question is, can that scale up uh, continue uh, as people become more efficient, as sites become more familiar with using these medications? So those, those are big questions. And it is a challenging area, and that's why we think there's such a need for community advocacy on an ongoing basis, because we really have some great tools, uh, circumcision, the use of antiviral medication uh, for prevention. Uh, but to make these effective, the community has to buy in to know what it entails, what, if you're uh, asymptomatic and you're going on treatment early, because in some, some settings going on treatment, people in some parts of the world say, oh, well, that means I'm sick, that means I'm dying, and I don't feel like I'm dying, I don't want to go on these medications. It means understanding the need for adherence and understanding the reasons why people may not adhere to medications. So that means behavioral health services in many places that don't have the infrastructure. So there's an awful lot of things we have to attend to if we want to get it right. But the, the best of times now is the fact that we do have uh, tools to really change the curve of the epidemic globally. And, and we hope that there will continue to be political will to provide the resources we need to do the work. If I might also add something, I think uh, Dr. Mayer's talking has, has hit an important point, and that is that adherence is uh, is proving to be a real challenge mm -hmm. in some of the populations. So for the young women in South Africa, there was a real problem with adherence such that there wasn't an ability to see whether or not this intervention worked. On, uh, on the other hand, for the uh, PrEP trials, there has been good communication, good understanding of the community such that adherence was very good, and then we saw the results. 
Uh, so, so it underscores the need to understand how you need to uh, explain uh, and involve a community and find the right niche for an intervention. The other important thing is that interventions that don't require adherence are also going to be extremely, extremely important, or interventions that only require uh, limited adherence, only several doses for long-acting drugs or something like that. But we need to think about this as we move forward because it's very, very important. So the challenge is uh, education, adherence, uh, education about adherence, and if you uh, will, I mean, this is something that has certainly been uh, a challenge everywhere, whether you're in a developing world or a Absolutely. developed world yeah, or, right. or a middle-income countries, it doesn't matter. And I constantly suggest to people uh, adherence, 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 education, yeah. and they say, oh no, not in other, but you know, it seems as though you can't do enough of it because it is one of the most critical pieces. You know, it's like Mike Sachs says, the, the drugs that people, the, the best drugs that people can take are the ones that will, they'll take. Right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, so if we, if we manage to find that, and or like you say, if there's a challenge uh, in taking the drugs, the, the injectables or the ways they don't have to take drugs, they just basically get an injection once a month or every three months. Or one-time adherence, or one-time intervention like male circumcision. Right. right. So th that's that's at least 50% or 60% uh, effective. It's it's additive. And exactly. the other thing is if we do have these uh, opportunities uh, for this, this new advances in treatment, they're for a population that is sorely needing it, such as people, that their lives are chaotic or young lives where they don't have that ability to be, mm -hmm. they, they don't want to have the, the vestiges of um, of drugs around, you know, in their place. Because or the then perception of risk. Young perception people are risk. not good at, at determining their own risk. It's, yeah. it, it's a problem. It's, it's part of the... They're in, people, uh, the invincible. invincible. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, and in the uh, vaginal gel study, they found that the majority of the young women enrolled lived at home. So first, um, you have to get your stash of applicators containing this medication that you're getting once a month and keep it in a place where your family is not in your business. But then if you're, uh, if you're at home, you're not having sex with a new partner at home, you're going to his place or going out meeting somewhere else. And that may or may not be after you manage to remember to put it in a purse or a pocket. Yeah. Yeah. Right, and you know, and then ha you know, <coughs> schlepping two applicators with you because the protocol was you know, one before sex, one after sex. So there's a fair amount of planning involved in that kind of situation. And usually the young people are more spontaneous than, than, uh, than planning. I don't know many that plan sex. That's yes, right. exactly. Right. So um, what else have you learned at this conference that, that really uh, bears on the, I guess the, the biggest thing, and I, I did want to ask you this before we go any further, funding, flat funding is something we can't tolerate. We have to find out ways to get new money and, or, or additional money. And so uh, is that, does, how does that, where do we get it? Did the government have to rethink this this uh, sequestration and, and flat funding? And because it it just isn't acceptable. We cannot uh, abide by uh, the inability to fund appropriately things which are going to be so meaningfully problematic down the line if we don't fully fund projects that can have a, a, an enormous result up front, which would be downstream more effective having dealt with it up front instead of later. Right, well that's the point, you know, um, there's, there were several studies presented here about cost effectiveness of some of these new approaches. So there's no question that in the long run there will be savings. The challenge is that for many politicians, uh, they're not thinking long run, they're thinking in the short term. Mm -hmm. We have a budget deficit, um, this is a population I don't care so much about, I didn't get elected on global health. Platform. So that's where the community voice really needs to keep reminding people that um, you know we all have a stake in this, and it's ridiculous to let the epidemic get worse when we have tools to arrest it and actually slow it down substantially. We don't have a cure. We don't have vaccine yet. So you know, optimizing these approaches that have evidence behind them um, is really key. I think we need some activism. Like, uh, is it David Sachs up in Harvard that is an economist who? Who, uh, Jeff Sachs? Jeff, is it Jeffrey Sachs? Yeah. Yes. That, that I mean, that can really make a powerful stand and say, look, we're talking about infrastructures of countries. We're talking about, you know, things like that 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 will destabilize, you know, regimes and and end up in chaos. And, and we, I mean, that's I think what President Clinton looked at in Africa, 
and, and we're, we're, it's not any different now. We were just talking about the destabilization through Ebola. I mean, that's, it's not widespread in Africa, but it is in, in areas that are becoming, you know, dramatically destabilized. So it's, I don't think it's, it matters whether it's Ebola or whether it's AIDS or it's TB or malaria or whatever. If we can't manage to keep their country, uh, the people that are living there employed because they're all in the hospitalization or chaotic lives because they can't, they're, they're, and, and the health departments apparently, in, like where the Ebola, they just abandon and they all run from, from these, right. these systems. So we have to figure out how to, so I think maybe the, the fact that we can get people who can take a stand on economics, I mean, that's just one other front. That's right. To the fight. That's right. And, and, and prep to a targeted, uh, a targeted prep and male circumcision in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, Eastern and Southern Africa are both tremendously cost-effective interventions. And so there's an expression that is pay now or pay later. But with these, it's pay now or pay more later, mm -hmm. because that's what it'll be. And so that is, you know, something that needs to be can, taken into One time simple thing, because it's, it's I mean, if, if, if we just add that additive, okay, so that's 60%, if we did a, a wide-scale, you know, circumcision plan, 60% uh, less population infected, I mean, that's, that's huge. Yes, and the cost savings of that has been estimated to be 16 billion. That's with a B. 16 billion dollars. Over. You to, over um, till uh, 20, uh, 2025. Mm -hmm. And that's um, of uh, 20 million men between the ages of 15 and 49 in Eastern and Southern Africa. So it's, it's tremendously cost cost savings and, 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 and you know, well, well worth the spend. We have a number of in interventions for circumcisions that have been presented in uh, Melbourne, I believe, the Shans Ring, among others, mm -hmm. that make it very simple and not very troublesome or for a, a grown men to do this. And I know I've done programs at the, uh, uh, on the, uh, Len the uh, SS Lincoln in, up here in Washington, um, you know, uh, educational programs. Mm -hmm. And one of the things on the mili uh, 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 medicine and the military, and one of their main things that they do is circumcision when they're doing nothing else. <laughs> Apparently, I don't know, it's just maybe it's like getting a tattoo or something. So it's not a big deal, and they do it. You know? Yeah, and the programs in Africa have been very, very safe. And that, of course, is the most, one of the most important things you have to think of up front mm -hmm. is does it work and is it safe? Mm -hmm. and, and the adverse event rates, the rates of adverse events, is less than 1% in these programs. They're very, very safe. We're down to a few minutes. I want to make sure we cover what you need to cover and what we you don't want to miss. So. Well, there was um, also some important information about tuberculosis mm -hmm. at this meeting. You know, tuberculosis is an important co-infection with HIV, especially in areas of the world where the rates of TB are higher than in the US, for example, or Europe. So rates of tuberculosis in Southern and US, in Africa are, are quite high. And then uh, TB is fueled by HIV. Um, in South Africa, there was a study that was called the Temprano study that was, con uh, I'm sorry, it was conducted in Cote d'Ivoire, but we heard about it at this meeting. And it, it looked at the use of antiretroviral therapy to restore immunity and the use of isoniazid as TB preventive therapy. And uh, the two together were very effective in preventing tuberculosis. So that was some very good news. On the not so good news uh, front was that there's a, a the transmission of XDR-TB, which is a resistant TB, a very dangerous TB, uh, in South Africa continues, um, and that um, it is mostly in people who also have HIV infection. So um, it's a very bad co-infection, and there is still effort needed to try to prevent and effectively treat this uh, important and dangerous form of tuberculosis. Yeah, and the only thing I would say, and I imagine you've covered in other um, interviews, uh, the hepatitis C uh, data is just stunning. So it's very, it reminds me very much of Vancouver in 1996, mm -hmm. where returning in curve, Absolutely. you know, and if we recall in 1996, the drugs weren't perfect, but we had the proof of concept that they worked. Mm -hmm. uh, and so now with the new um, uh, array of drugs, we know that interferon is a thing of the past, ribavirin is a thing of the mm -hmm. past. But once again, it's the issue that if you just take the United States, for example, uh, there are more than 3 million uh, Americans living with hepatitis C. 
And unlike HIV, where we think it's one in five or a little less are unaware of their infection with hepatitis C, it's the inverse. So it's about 80% of people in the US with hepatitis C are unaware of their infection. Yet a substantial number of those people are at risk for uh, further complications down the road, liver problems. So it's another challenge to scale up, to be able to uh, motivate people to get tested, train clinicians to start knowing how to use these new medications. But the biggest issue is obviously getting the cost down. The costs are exorbitant at this point in time. And the hope is that, uh, again, uh, uh, from the community, from you know, both professional communities, but uh, grassroots community activism is necessary, <coughs> sorry, to remind the pharmaceutical companies that they, they can realize a profit and still sell these medications for a lot less. Mm -hmm. The hope is that as more uh, directly acting antiviral agents come into the field, that there will be uh, substantially uh, more pressure to lower the prices, but, but certainly time is of the essence for that as well. Because treatment is, uh, once again, treatment is prevention. Yes. That's right. And treatment is 12 weeks, well tolerated, mm -hmm. a pill, I mean, how, as, and that is curing this, this infection that was a major cause of liver yeah. cancer and right. death. I mean, how great is that? We really need to work hard at trying to lower the prices. And like you say, as they come into the field, we need to have price rollbacks. Uh, whatever they can do and also make uh, patient assistance programs readily available for people that otherwise can't afford it. And Absolutely. get people who are infected identified because as yeah. Kent said that's a real problem. Yeah, it's part of the yeah. community viral load. You yeah. Bring it down. Do ask, do tell. Yeah. You got the last word. <laughs> Thank you.